Hello, welcome to HLA Live. HLA Live is our regular broadcast on the HLA YouTube channel as well as all the other social media channels. Each week we talk to interesting people from across the HLA community. Good evening everyone, I am really excited to be chairing tonight's meeting. Hi, I'm Rosie Spooner and I'm hosting HLA Live this Wednesday. And I'm an HLA scholar and I'm also going to be your host this evening. To share with us their ideas and their innovations and hopefully bring them to a global audience. Quite quick, we have ideas, let's do this, let's do that, so... Many of the topics come from our community, with scholars and faculty expressing an interest in many of the discussions that we're about to have. Hello everyone and welcome to the HLA live session on widening participation in the postgraduate realm. Homelessness and health. Addiction and the new normal. HLA programmes are built on six pillars. The leader is an innovator and entrepreneur. The leader is a communicator. The leader is a manager. The leader as a negotiator. The leader as a follower and the leader as a philosopher. If you are interested in becoming a HLA scholar, why not get in contact? Many of the episodes in HLA Live will cover one or more of these important pillars. The HLA team consists of Pedra, Eamon, Tim, Riddy, Alistair, Adil and Trisha and a range of other HLA scholars and faculty. Episode 38 of HLA Live is hosted by our HLA scholar Christine Mahota and is entitled Resilience for Healthcare Professionals. It is a special episode for World Health Day. Hi everyone and thank you for joining us and welcome to this new episode of HLA Live. I'm Christine Mahota, a fourth year medical student at Cardiff University and one of this year's HLA scholars. Now I've been working as part of a great team called Mind Health, which aims to reduce stigma around mental health and to promote resilience and well-being in health professionals and students. I'm also a volunteer in Wales for Papyrus UK, which is a suicide prevention charity for young people. Now it's a great honour for the first time and I'm really excited to be hosting this brilliant panel here this evening. And this episode is important and very relevant for a number of reasons. As we know, the past year has been challenging and unpredictable due to COVID-19, as many of us have had to adapt, live and work differently through this ongoing global pandemic. And for some people, this has affected their mental well-being too, alongside other factors. And he showed us, I'm sure, that we cannot always predict and plan everything in life. We don't always know what life will throw at us. However, we've seen that people can, at the same time, be incredibly compassionate and resilient in the face of adversity, such as NHS staff, who are here today as well. We need to look deeper into how to actually build our resilience and look after our well-being, as this is not talked about enough in the workplace and in training. And I'm hopeful that this discussion will empower you as a listener through hearing the stories, ideas and views of our panellists with tools that you can implement in your own life to build resilience through this pandemic and beyond, and also be encouraged to seek help if needed. So I'm joined today by an extraordinary panel of individuals who are amazing to get to know and I'm sure um, you will hear a lot from them and I will also let them introduce themselves in a second and to tell you more about their specialities and their interests. Uh, thanks very much Christine and thanks for inviting me. Um, if you'll have to excuse the rather attractive hairstyle I've just got out of theatre and having not been able to see my barber for the last three months it's probably looking a bit scary so hopefully this is voice only this session tonight. Uh, I'm Mark Stacey, I'm a consultant for uh, obstetric anaesthetist at Cardiff, uh, Cardiff and Vale. I am coming sort of to the end of my career in anaesthetic, having been a consultant for 25 years. So my particular interest, apart from managing the particularly challenging clinical processes that I often have to deal with, is performance under pressure. And the performance under pressure in a generic sense, so teaching individuals across specialties and across environments to perform in a very high pressure performance environment. I'm lucky enough to work with a professor of sports psychology and some of the elite military um, colleagues to look at things that we can learn from them, uh, practical skills that we can all implement in our lives. Uh, I love skills teaching and I have absolutely no doubt that if you embrace the processes of the way that you've trained in your past you can use it to improve future so you'll learn a bit more about me as the session goes on but that's me 
Hello, uh, my name is Wafa Arman. I'm currently an assistant psychologist for an independent practice in the West Midlands. Uh, we work with adults and children with complex presentations, and I specifically work on doing cognitive functioning assessments of um, parents involved in care proceedings in family court. Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in trauma, specifically war-related trauma. And yeah, thank you for having me today. Hi, um, so my name is Oliver. I'm an F1 in Sevendinary. Um, I have the classic imposter syndrome of all medics tonight, being on a panel of uh, professionals. <laughs> but um, I have a I have a sort of very personal interest in uh, well-being and in mental health, um, and it's something that kind of gets me up in the morning. And uh, I want to work in psychiatry, um, and I'm particularly interested in health positive approaches to psychiatry um, and I think my interest has sort of really grown from a time in med school where I took a year out after my mental health collapsed um, and developed really bad health anxiety and as a result of which really kind of became obsessively interested in this question of health and it was actually the only useful thing that <laughs> well not only one of the useful things that came out of that period was um, kind of really getting a grip on it for myself um, as to how I could um, start to feel just better and happier in, in myself. Um, and since then, uh, Christine and I are now working together um, with Mind Health, which is kind of hoping to uh, empower people with some practical tools for their mental well-being. Um, when I was at university, um, I started something called um, the Birmingham Mindfulness Project, um, which was um, the culmination of quite a lot of work I've done with mindfulness and meditation. Um, and I'm here today. So hi, nice to meet you all. Hi, hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm Jen, I'm a ST5 in old age psychiatry. I'm probably what is known as a forever trainee because it took me a little while to find my path into psychiatry. So I completed core medical training and GP training before I um, entered psychiatry and then did all my training in psychiatry part time. Um, but I'm finally an SPR, <laughs> made it. Um, I have a special interest in leadership in healthcare. I'm currently completing an MSc at the University in South, in South Wales in strategic leadership. And I'm currently a Royal College of Psychiatry Leadership Fellow this year, um, which is proving to be quite a steep learning curve, um, but it's been very valuable nonetheless. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Christine when she was with us on placement. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. No worries, it was a very good day. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome and thanks so much for joining me in time. And I'm sure it's going to be an interesting and hopefully thoughtful discussion. Now to kick start us off, I have a key question for you. What does resilience mean to you? And what have you learned through your own life story that has helped you to become more resilient? Uh, you talked about us just in the um, Oliver, I think I'm the person here with no aspirations to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But I'm probably the biggest imposter. And you may ask yourself, what on earth is an, is an anaesthetist doing talking about well-being? Well, resilience to me is, is both a, a static and a dynamic thing. And I think that is something that is often underappreciated by individuals and that our ability to cope with the demands that are put upon us changes depending on the environment we put in, the people that support us, the skills that we have, and quite a lot of factors, some of which we can control and some of which we can't, which I suspect Oliver with his interest in meditation will be very familiar with. Um, in terms of my personal journey, I got very interested in this particular topic when I was a registrar, so that is a hell of a long time ago. And I was struggling with trying to do the job I wanted to do with looking after family, um, like many of, many of us now and trying to do exams. And I really decided that unless I actually actively approached this as a, a problem that I could solve in the typical way that medics do, then I wasn't really going to do very well. And that's when I discovered there was a whole world out there of stuff that I arrogantly didn't think I needed. Uh, stress management's a tool, meditation. I discovered meditation at that time. And I've sort of gone on to develop and teach and manage a whole stack of other skills since, primarily because I'm interested in human performance, because you can only really perform well if you optimize all those skills. That's kind of how I look at it. I'll be very interested to hear what my, my psych, colleagues, uh, psych colleagues think. 
Um, yeah, I think resilience to me is just the ability to withstand um, and cope with maybe the different curveballs that life throws at us. Yeah, and I think to cope with those curveballs, you know, it, you either need external resources that are going to help you cope. So in the workplace, that might be better shift patterns or easy access to childcare or supportive supervisors, but also it's learning those internal resources um, that help you adapt and change and flex to allow you to become more resilient or more mentally tough or whatever the latest trendy buzzword is. But it really is having a mixture of external and in internal coping strategies that allow you to grow and develop. Um, and those are hard things sometimes to tap into. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think we'll definitely delve deeper in, in you know, soon actually, in terms of what are those internal external factors that we can use as well. And Oliver, did you have anything else to add onto that? Resilience is something that I've never really kind of thought about as the term itself. I realise that I've thought a lot about kind of the things that underpin in, in this area. Um, and Christine, I, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to quote you actually from the last session that we had um, with the HLA, uh, where you talk about seeing the opportunity in things. Um, and you shared this beautiful story of how in your life you've started to see the opportunities and all of the challenges that you've faced. And for me, I think that's um, when we talk about resilience from a personal perspective, um, because I think that we also need to talk about resilience of communities, resilience of systems and resilience from kind of a wider perspective. Um, but when we talk about resilience from a personal perspective, from well, as you alluded to and from my own experience it's about um seeing where the opportunities are in life to um, make the most of situations which are difficult and to respond to life's challenges in ways that um, make us happier and support the people around us at the same time i think i think that's hit the nail on the head and i and i really do um resonate with a lot of what you all said actually and I think generally people you know it's quite to generalize the word resilience as you know something bad happens you get back up and you carry on no matter what but I think looking in the past year and I'm sure from your own personal experiences it's not that simple and it's not that straightforward because actually those um, sort of diversities could be anything you know from having a bad shift to you know traumas and threats and significant sources of stress for example family relationship problems or financial stresses so there's there's kind of how do we get all these different tools and use them in so many different scenarios if that makes sense um, so looking into kind of your own life and you mentioned um, Jen about sort of having those internal external factors if somebody was to come to you and say well okay I want to to delve into that and actually see how do I build my, resi my resilience do you mind going into that a bit more I guess you can think of it as like I said earlier, in internal resources. So the resources that you have learned within yourself, they're not necessarily learned. You know, some of them, are nat some people seem naturally more resilient and other people take, term take time to learn their resilience over time. Um, and then there's the external resilience that, you know, like, we, like Oliver said about organizational resilience. That is so important. You know, we've seen the NHS this year flex and adapt to something, you know, that no one could have, well, no one could have predicted was going to happen when it did. Um, and it was a time of huge innovation and huge flexibility. Um, and it really is important that that continues to be built on now to help other people manage their own resilience. I yeah, definitely, definitely agree. And um, Dr. Stacey, you mentioned about sort of a it, it sounds like a turning point almost in your life when you're on sort of doing, you know, you, you said to me that you were doing sort of three days on and, you know, a really, really like, you know, tough shift pattern, I think at the time. And that turning point for you, my question actually to all of you is, does somebody have to go through adversity to be able to develop those internal factors? Does that make sense? Or are people born resilient? Or could, do we have to go through something that, is that turning point and then you're like okay sink or swim I choose to swim do you see what I mean? It's a very good question actually and it's interesting having supported many individuals over many years 
what, what I've found is that some people are definitely more able to deal with what you want to call it the low mm -hmm. um, and some people aren't but they can be taught now the issue about having a particular one of the things I've certainly been encouraging over the last 10 years is yes if you have a horrible event it might change you it might point you down one of two paths uh, there is a term in the psychological literature called post-traumatic growth I prefer to use the term anti-fragile which is something gets stronger when you try and break it so rather than getting into the concern I have about the use of the word resilience or mental toughness I, I can't be bothered to get into that debate I talk about the word anti-fragile for many individuals it's from there the turning point in, a, in another direction they will give up medicine they'll go off to do other things it's not necessarily a bad thing but it's just it's often a shame if they've spent their entire life training to do that I've seen both pathways taken um, but it is it's, it's a very interesting concept and and people are different I think the other point to make that I think is really really important is we can all fail I don't care how strong you are how resilient you think you are how well skilled you are everybody fails if you push that enough I discovered this for myself 10 years ago when I was been a consultant for 15 years I had a series of absolutely horrendous events both in my personal life and work I think what is so brilliant about about all of you is just you're sharing your sort of lived experiences and sort of things that have worked for you which is I'm hoping other people can draw on that experience and I think what you said about being anti-fragile at a time like this I feel like inherently you know are we as health professionals sort of inherently more resilient because you kind of have to be if that makes sense to deal with those things to go back to work the next day despite having a rough time you know is that something that you intrinsically have to have it gets screened at interview it gets screened at you know different i'm sure nhs job interviews you know it gets screened all the time but it's like is it something that we all inherently have to have absolutely um you know i know that when the pandemic broke um, my husband got COVID, he's, a, he's an A&E consultant, he managed to pick up COVID before they were even testing for it and during that time then they announced the lockdown just as we were coming out of our isolation, there was childcare, I'd been placed in Bridgend which was about 60 miles away from where I live, um, I had that commute on top, um, my mum is an ITU nurse and I was worrying about her um trying to meet all my educational requirements and i just felt absolutely overwhelmed but what i did recognize was that i needed to reach out and get some help and support and i think it's understanding when you're at your limit when your bucket is full and you can't take any more it's understanding that that is the time to reach out and i think that is something that maybe we don't teach enough throughout the curriculum at university, um, not just medicine, you know, any of the healthcare professions. Um, and it's allowing people to develop their understanding when they can say, I am at my limit and I need to reach into that toolkit to do something to help. I, I love that. And I think what you said about that recognition that, you know, what well, I actually need a, you know, a bit of extra support. I think that is what people need to understand. And I think it's so lovely having us here today and tell, you know, showing that like, you know, we've all gone through things that have been tough and actually sometimes you might be able to, you know, pick yourself up in whichever way and whatever toolkit you use, but actually that external help is absolutely fine. No, yeah, I completely agree about knowing um, your limits and seeking help because sometimes like for me, I'm quite an independent person and sometimes it feels hard to actually reach out for help. Yeah, so just breaking past that sort of barrier and actually admitting and knowing when you're at your limits and being able to sort of access the help that's out there. I think as as healthcare professionals, we like to to feel like we're the people who are taking care of, of other people and that we're able to support other people and I think there's potentially a perspective in that that if we're not able to take care of ourselves then kind of you know we're failing at, at something um, and I think the, the, the only thing I can add to the points that have been raised is that medicine is seems like a treadmill and I, I'm sure other people know this much better than I do but it took me seven years to get through medical school and that year that I took out was 
a year where I had, I, I fought against it, like really, really hard. And I tried to stay in for as long as I could because mostly I was terrified of having nothing to do and being at home alone all day. Um, but I think one, once you actually take that jump and you take that leap and you actually step out, you recognize that the job's not going anywhere. You're not getting left behind. And um, that for me was a real perspective shift of being like, it's okay, I, I, I can take this time for myself. I can um, be there for me and, and the job's not going anywhere. That's so good to hear. And so so thank you so much, um, all of you for sharing. And actually, Oliver, you know, look at you now, you know, actually that time out has obviously, we you know, worked, which is great. And I think, you know, every time we go on holiday and they do the flight announcement and no one ever listens to this, but you know, when they say, you know, put your mask on first, then you're busy trying to find the film on the thing, and you don't actually listen. But it's very, very true. You know, put your mask on first before the people. It's exactly the same. If you're not well, you can't then look after the, your patients, you know, for the best, you know, to the best of your ability. And I think that um, what we said before about that support, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, formal support. It could just be reaching out to friends. I know I've rang Wafa millions of times, <laughs> you know, like help, you know, and that's 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 also the same, you know, what, what are kind of your sources of support sometimes? I look at it slightly differently now to the way that, that Jen did in that uh, I actually think you don't want to get to that point where you need to ask for help. You want to be asking for help before you get to that point. And the problem with a lot of us is that we're very bad at recognizing that. And just going back to the sort of the, the, the selection question, which none of us really answered. Um, I think there's absolutely no doubt that if you're going to come into this kind of environment, you have to be aware that bad things happen, COVID or not. And I spend my, my life telling medical students and they look at me like I've grown two heads. You know, I'm afraid you're going to go into a job where you'll do everything right and bad things will happen. And as an individual, that's very difficult to deal with. It's certainly something I have struggled with over the years and I've taught lots of other people. I'm probably better at teaching it than I am at managing it myself. So what, one of the things I try and encourage now is to have this prophylactic approach. Don't get to that point. Don't get to that falling off the cliff bit before you start asking for help on the way, help on the way down. Do it before you get there. And we can all do that. You've just got to make a proactive approach to it. Um, and it's certainly what, you know, one of the things that we teach outside of medicine with sport and military because of their high performance environment, they have to learn that lesson very quickly. Otherwise, they just don't succeed. Yeah, and that's a very good point, actually. There was a BMJ article that looked into um, burnout um, in healthcare, and it was basically looking at a case for organisational change. And it basically acknowledged the fact that there is an issue and that organisations need to actually focus on developing a healthy workplace and actually preventing the burnout in the first place rather than just being reactive when people get to that point. And I think your point about sort of medical students you know, all the time you know kind of prepare yourself before you get there because it's inevitably you're going to see bad things happen in an ideal world no one will be sick and we won't believe it you know but that's just not how it works and from your experience how can someone begin to develop that how can they be able to recognize that you know what are the signs that people are looking for before they get to that and this idea of kind of self-awareness is something that has something that has just been such a big feature for myself over the last three years of how do I recognize when things are difficult for me? How do I recognize when I'm turning to all of the old habitual patterns that, you know, don't necessarily push me in the right direction? And for me, and I'd, I'd say this because it's helped me personally, has been um, exploring mindfulness and meditation. Um, and when I was unwell, it was actually the thing that really kind of um, helped center me and helped me to start building this awareness of how it was I was actually feeling at any given point in time. And if there was anxiety there, it was today there's anxiety here, or if there's depression, today there's depression, or whatever it was. And I think what I've taken from that period and from a long time that I spent on, on retreats and things like that is that I have this sense now of what's actually happening. And I know that I don't necessarily need to buy into it in the same way. I can let it be that I can let the anxiety be that I can let the, um, the imposter syndrome be there, whatever it is. Um, and know that my instinctive reaction is going to be to have a drink or to go and kind of do something that makes me feel like I'm kind of progressing in my career or whatever it is and just taking a step back and being like it's all cool it's all chill <laughs> so yeah yeah definitely and I think um I can really appreciate that actually because I think you mentioned before as well Oliver about medicine feeling like a treadmill sometimes and I'm sure you know Wafa as well in your in your field of work sometimes you 
you know, I know where you know, where you're trying to get to as well. And it's kind of you feel like I have to get this publication and do this first, and then I want to do this, and then you know, there's so many things you're trying to tick off that list. You know, you've got this sort of educational requirement alongside your work that you're trying to excel in. And sometimes, you know, how did you find that balance, Oliver? You know, how did you get to a place where you can say, okay, today I just today's just not my day, and that's okay, and I can let myself feel this. You know, how did you get to that level? Um, with practice. Um, when when I was really unwell, I had severe OCD, and I don't know that people quite appreciate what OCD means, but it means that you have horrific intrusive thoughts that essentially make you hate yourself, and that's the bottom line of all OCD. Um, and for me at least, it was this process of learning to be nice to myself, <laughs> asking like, how can I actually be my own best friend today? And that cycle just repeating itself and starting to recognise that if you start to take care of yourself, if you start to be kind and understanding towards the way that you are, that you're able to kind of turn towards things in a way that allows you to, to change things and to build a better future rather than just get stuck in this thing that you never want to look at and you just want to run away from. And so for me at least, it was this process of being forced to confront lots and lots of things and facing them and kind of recognizing all of these patterns and then starting to find a way to, to change them and build something that was more productive. I think it's really interesting, Oliver, what you're saying about OCD. I'm an anaesthetist. I think probably most of my colleagues, certainly the good ones, are all pretty much have a very much an OCD approach to their probably their lives and their work. I mean, I thought in, up until about 2010 that I could control the weather and discovered, as I say, after a series of very unfortunate events that I, I couldn't. And one of the philosophies I've tried to embed both in myself and the people I work with and support is what they call the three C's of Stoic philosophy. So the first C is control what you can. And I think the, the reality is sometimes we think we can control things we can't. The second C is, is uh, cope with what you can't. And that's where I think skills like mindfulness are absolutely fantastically, pretty much the only way of dealing with those particular processes. And the last C, which is, I'm ashamed to say, as a near 60 year old, I've, I've only really learned in my 50s, but I'm trying to encourage people to think about a lot more is concentrate on what counts. And I think particularly in this last year, it's, it's something that as clinicians, you talked about the treadmill, you've got to decide, you know, your time is your most important and most valuable asset. You've really got to be careful how you spend it. And I think certainly I, I look back on my life and probably spend a bit too much time working and possibly a bit not enough time looking after the things that were slightly more important than work was. So that's my sort of, my three C's I find very useful. If I get up and, as you say, I get up in the morning, I'm thinking, right, am I, how am I approaching this particular issue? There's a, sorry, I'll jump in again, just because I, I love the kind of stoic stuff as well. There's two quotes that, that stick with me from, from sort of the period that I've, that I've been through recently. And one is a picture that he says, learn to wish that everything should come to pass exactly as it does. Um, and I remember looking at that and thinking that doesn't sound possible. And it also doesn't sound like sensible. Um, uh, but actually exploring that has been kind of a sense of, can I accept that this is the way that things are right now, even if, even if I hate it. And the second is um, a, a Greek expression, amor fati, which translates as love of fate. And it's this idea of kind of loving the, or just playing the cards that you're dealt and not wishing that they were other than that they are. Um, so yeah, there's my two, <laughs> two points. <laughs> Um, I think for me, it's as cheesy as it may sound, is um, actually accepting that it's okay not to be okay. Um, because I feel like a lot of times in the past, I've, so for example, if I took a day off because I was unwell or had like a migraine episode, I would beat myself up about it, like you should be working. At, at times I had to even convince myself like you're actually in pain, that's why you have a day off. So actually recognizing when you're not feeling well or when things are not going fine and knowing that it's okay to feel that way and sort of being having self-compassion during those moments and knowing that taking care of yourself is part of productivity and it's not counterproductive. I think for me I'm a bit of a ruminator and I'm a perfectionist and add the two together it means you can get really stuck on the small stuff um, and I think I was listening to a TED talk one day and um the psychologist was talking about Viktor Frankl. I don't know if anyone's heard of him, but he's quite a world famous psycho uh, psychotherapist, but he's also a Holocaust survivor. 
and he talk, he's got this quote where he talks about having a stimulus and response, but between the stimulus and response, there is a space. And within that space is your power to choose and you can choose to grow and you can choose your freedom. So what he means by that is if the response is how you behave and the stimulus is what's stressing you out, you can create a space to change how you're behaving. So instead of, say I had a workplace-based assessment and it was majoritively positive and you know, they always have to give, there's always room to improve. So they give you some negative feedback. I would come home and sit on the sofa and really like let that tick over in my mind. And actually what I've learned is I can choose not to do that. I can choose to behave differently. Um, and instead, you know, think of a much more positive coping strategy. So um, my poor kids get dragged up the mountain now <laughs> for a walk. Um, but that is, you know, a much more positive way of distracting myself from those ruminations. And um, yeah, I just think it's a really powerful quote. And, you know, we do have a choice to choose to manage our emotions and feelings and then our behavior differently and it's really important to develop those skills to allow you to do that. I think that's a fabulous summary of Frankel's work. Uh, there's another uh, Holocaust survivor author that's worth looking at if, if you want to read some more about that kind of stuff called Edith Eager who's the female equivalent. She also survived yeah. the concentration camps through the Second World War and she, one of the books she's written is called The Choice and she explores exactly that concept and it's something that we talk about on our courses when we're dealing with individuals who've suffered what we call a potentially traumatic event, not a traumatic event because it's not the event so much that's the problem, it's our interpretation of that. Mm. It's the emotion that we put on that, it's the choice and how we decide to approach that and I think what's interesting, there's another quote that Frankel uses, which I use a lot, is it's, it's, uh, which I've, I've, of course I can't remember now because I'm faced by your intelligent faces, but it's along the lines of um, when you're dealing with a problem, you have a choice to either treat that problem as a threat or a challenge. And if mm -hmm. you treat it as a threat, it becomes, it causes exactly the same response as if it was a real threat. So COVID's a good example for, for you know, I've been working at the front line for the last year. Yes, it's there. But actually there are other things that I could get disastrously wrong in my work if I don't actually focus on my work. So I've approached it, look, it's a challenge. I'm gonna to have to deal with it. I'm gonna to have to wear all the annoying PPE and stuff, but I'm gonna do the best I can for my patients. And one of the things about human beings, as I said earlier, is we are fantastic problem solvers. But if you embrace the problem as a threat, you won't try and solve that problem. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, that was a lovely summary, actually. I love that bit about the space, as you say, between, between the, the stimulus and the, and the response. Yeah, I think it's just recognising that you can choose to react in a different way. I think we all get really stuck sometimes in our behaviours. And it's just actually saying, OK, I need to, need to do things a bit differently. Um, my husband's a bit of a... He's an A&E consultant, so he's probably very different minded to me. And he's he realised he needed to start behaving differently. So he's got really into Wim Hof and is having ice cold showers every morning. <laughs> <laughs> Old Wim Hof. That, that, that's, yeah. that's crazy stuff. That's completely yeah. crazy stuff. But, you know, I guess it. I was thinking about it and I guess it is a form of mindfulness, though. <laughs> Can I, can I ask a question of the group, which is that for people who, who don't have that space, who feel like they don't have that space, who feel as though these things happen and, and there's no controlling them, how can, how can we support people or how can people support themselves to, to grow that space? Okay, so one of the simplest skills I teach, and you'll be familiar with this, I'm sure, Oliver, is what's called box breathing. Um, and what you're doing in box breathing is, so just, the, just for the audience really, is the plan is you breathe in and you count four, you hold for the count of four, breathe out for the count of four, hold for the count of four. And I say to people, when you feel that panic coming on, do it four times or do it for longer as necessary. I teach it to patients, I teach it to trainees, I teach it to consultant colleagues. And what you're doing with that particular process, if you practice it in a non-stress environment, so that you can use it in a stress environment, is you're using your physiology to control your psychology. Because what that slowing, and it's a bit like the Wim Hof stuff, it's the same sort of physiological background. It slows your heart rate right down. It stops you generating that acute sympathetic nervous response, the tachycardia, the hypertension, the feelings of fear, the, the, the shaky hands. 
And just by doing that, it brings you back an, an opportunity to, to create a space um, so that you can then reframe the way that you're addressing that problem. It's actually a surprisingly powerful tool. I, some of my colleagues use it if they can't sleep at night as well. Interestingly, we, we, <laughs> the special forces t learn it. Um, and we've been teaching it to a lot of our elite athletes because when they've got severe per performance anxiety, it enables them to bring things, because they understand this physiology bit. Um, mm. And I think as clinicians, we should hopefully also understand that, that physiology. So that's one skill. There are lots of other skills, but that's a really powerful one. What I um, really take home from that is the sense of that space and knowing how to create that space. As although you're saying well, it was a simple thing, but actually if you practice that and able to do that when you most need it, like you said, that could literally make all the difference between you being you know, too stressed to your job and actually you being able to control yourself and get back to yourself to a grounding level. And I really like what you said about Kind of doing the best that you can and i think you know are we getting into this culture part where people always want to do more there's always more to do and i can't you know fall down for too long because always more to do and i gotta get there like you know what is just your best and how do we get to this point where we're just okay with being do, we're doing the best we can right now but for some reason in the back of our head it's just human nature but we're always like oh we've just got to do more we've got to keep going sometimes actually what you said about creating that space and going for that walk up the mountain, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? And it doesn't have to be long either. <laughs> so Oliver was asking for you know, skills, and I guess that box breathing exercise is so good because it, you can do it in 30 seconds. You know, It doesn't have to be a two hour trek up a mountain to create that space. There are very small things you can do to change your behaviors. It doesn't have to be something very exciting. Um, but just something like a breathing technique. Other people, you know, if they can feel the anxiety building, like the sort of plunging their hands in cold water or the snapping their el elastic band against their wrist to help ground them. You know, it, it can be anything really. And what you need to do is try and see what works for you because everyone is different and what works for me won't necessarily work for the next person. I think, I think for me, there's this sense of, um when I recognize that something's going on it's just about pausing just in that moment and it's just recognizing something's going on and I don't necessarily need to understand it completely but something's going on and if I don't pause now I'm going to lash out or I'm going to do something that's kind of not very helpful and just having that moment of okay and then it's that moment of having a look inside and being like so what's actually going on and then giving it a name maybe and then trying to somehow bring some level of self-compassion to that and just trying to diffuse the whole kind of vicious cycle that goes around it where you're kind of like, why do I feel like this? And beating yourself up and then and then finding some way of, of responding that, that's practical. Yeah, I think in light of that, um, one of the skills I've learned from mindfulness, just a, it's a basic thing adding onto your normal routine. So we really, we don't think about, there's a lot of things we do on autopilot. So whether that's like showering in the morning, brushing your teeth, so picking one of those things that you do, so whether it's showering and really being in that moment, so like smelling your bath soap, um, feeling when, yeah, so just thinking about all your senses and being in that moment as opposed to like thinking, what am I going to do today? This is what I need to do and that sort of thing. So really being present in that moment and just picking one thing that you do every day where you will be fully present in that moment. And if you fancy trying the Wim Hof technique of having the cold showers, I tell you <laughs> at the moment they are really cold and you suddenly become very aware of just how cold they are. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think it is, again, it's coming back to that, what, what works for you because hell will freeze over before I have a cold shower. I mean, there is <laughs> there's no way I'm going to do that. And also I know that I am quite an active person. So I'm the traditional forms of mindfulness I find very difficult. Um, but something that might be going out for a walk and doing what Wafa said with the senses, or just going out for a walk and putting my phone in my pocket and saying I'm not going to look at it for the next hour is sometimes just enough. It doesn't have to be something fancy. I'm glad you mentioned phones because it's one of my big bugbears, okay? So a couple of things about phones. First thing is ban them from the bedroom. Unless you're yeah. on call, don't have your phone in your bedroom. Uh, and same for your kids if you've got kids, particularly if they've got phones. The second thing is there's some work that came out, there was a publication last year and it's something that I wasn't surprised to read about, is the effect that 
if you use your phone when you're having a break, let's say a coffee break or your lunch break, it actually interferes with your performance after that break. So in my, on my labor ward, actually drives the midwives mad is we ban the phones from the, from the break room. And what we try and encourage is to actually have a conversation around recipes. So often people will have cooked something, oh, that's really nice. How did you make that? And then we'll swap these recipes. I discovered uh, the tray bake books uh, on, a, on the back of one of these. And if you haven't tried them, particularly those of you who are working and like your food, there are some fantastic recipes in there that are so easy to do. Even I can't mess them up. But I wouldn't have learned that if we'd been looking at our phone. So ban the phone. Your phone gives you this constant influx of sensory information. And so looking at it in your break, you're not giving yourself time to switch off. You're also isolating yourself because you've got your eyes down at your phone. And instead, you really need to be engaging with your peer group for peer support, you know, in the mess. Uh, or in absolutely. The... Absolutely. Yeah. Phones are, are one of my bugbears too. And I think it links so much into sleep. So looking at your phone before bedtime is akin to having a couple of cups of coffee. I think the research is. Um, and I know that when I'm on call and I've got my phone next to me, my sleep is just dreadful. Um, so yeah, I agree with Mark that phones stay outside. I'm so glad that we brought this up. The last two weeks, I, I've always been, you know, I always say my sleep is the most important thing to me and it's the one thing that I always fail at and it's, it's never been good. And the last two weeks ago, it was just this stretch of just not getting sleep for just like an hour, like nothing horrific, but just enough to be like, this is really annoying. I was like, I'm going to implement a really strict routine. And it's one that I, I've done forever. I'll be like, oh, you know, okay, I'm just going to put my phone on charge like an hour before and then I'm going to do all these things. But this time I was like, are you going to do it seriously? So I've been putting my phone on charge an hour before, putting my laptop away and then having to find something to do in the meantime. And I don't read um, fiction uh, because I'm just not a fiction person. But the, the last two weeks I sat down with a very good book and have been reading that and, you know, having a shower and things that kind of help me unwind. And I've been falling asleep in 10, 15 minutes as opposed to 45 minutes or an hour. And because I'm starting to build that in, when it gets to 11 o'clock, I'm like, okay, right, it's, it's time to get to bed now. And it's it's, the last four days I completely slipped and uh, yesterday I completely got back on schedule again. So it comes and goes, but um, that's what I'm working on at the moment. I think sleep in for healthcare professionals, you know, it's so important for your mental well-being, and yet we work these crazy shift patterns. You know, the nurses will work a long day and then come in for an early shift the next day. That it is so detrimental to our physical health and our mental health. And I think teaching good sleep hygiene and the importance of rest should begin on day one at university. Um, I, I totally agree, Jenna. Again, the research on performance, particularly, you know, so this is outside of medicine, but it's obviously as true of medicine as of any other high performance environment. Sleep is the most important performance enhancing agent we have. You mess it up at your peril, really. And you know what it's like. If you have a good night's sleep, you wake up in the morning, you can take on the world. You have a bad night's sleep, that's a wholly different set, set of fish. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, thank you so much, um, all of you, for sharing. And I think good sleep hygiene. When you said about the phone, I thought, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is going to be really hard. I thought anything else. <laughs> One of the things you know you need to do, but you don't want to hear. Yeah. You. <laughs> You're like, I'm, I'm literally, when I was like, I'm falling asleep in 10 minutes. So I'm just there two hours late to like rolling around, like on different TikTok videos. And, oh, okay. Yeah. I need to, yes. Yeah. We're not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm still working on it as well. <laughs> um, so I think we, we mentioned before as well. Um, so some of the, just to summarize some of the sort of skills that we've come up with actually. Um, so something, you know, really as simple as breathing exercises, so box breathing and sort of practicing that so they can actually enforce that when needed. You know, something like, for example, putting ha your hand in cold water or having a, a rubber band around your wrist, find anything that kind of works for you and practicing that to ground yourself. And also what I mentioned about being in the moment. So it could be something that you do on a daily basis, just showering, or and just actually be there don't think about the work list you've got to do or the long drive to work and just try and actually focus in that time if you're an active person you can consider exercising or going out for a walk without your phone 
or try and also having conversations with your colleagues as well at work you know and watching your screen time while you're there as well on breaks is that can affect productivity and also just have a pause like Oliver said and think about what's actually going on around you and have some self-compassion and then good sleep hygiene and looking after yourself as a priority I think that learning that I think I find it so much easier and magically me to look after other people when it comes to myself I just somehow can't always apply the same principle um, one thing I want to touch up on actually is we mentioned this before about support and I think this is something that I don't know if it's just with healthcare professionals I don't know if we're afraid of vulnerability but there is definitely a culture I don't I don't want to call it a culture but I think generally speaking we, there is still a stigma around mental health you know you even just in general population you have to look at the sort of yesterday you know, Meghan Markle, for example, you know, I know she's not in healthcare, but I'm trying to say it's quite, it's still something that we need to destigmatize and work on to actually say, you know, it's completely okay to seek help. What advice would you give to somebody who's struggling with that? Well, I think you're, you know, you're totally right. We know that the symptoms of burnout, you know, will lead to depression, anxiety, and other associated mental illness. And we know that, you know, mental illness is a common amongst healthcare professionals. I think it's about 25% are at risk of mental illness during their career. And with suicide rates, you know, in the profession being about two to four times higher um, across all specialities, um, some more than others. So psychiatry and anaesthetists have particularly higher rates as well as GPs. I think, you know, seeking early, timely help is the most important thing you can do and trying to pick things up early. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is um, international medical graduates because they have a very different set of needs and they are also much more um, at risk of mental illness, self-harm and suicide. Um, and I think, you know, they, they need a lot of extra and different support to what um, British medical graduates need um, and I think it's just being aware of that and be, so that it can be offered early. I, I know lots of people who um, want to get help or they think that they should get help but there's something that really holds them back and I wondered what it is that holds people back and how we can help people to somehow reach out. Mm. You know stigma and prejudice mental illness is still very much around you know and you have to pick up the paper today and you can see the stigma of saying you've had suicidal thoughts. Um, you know, that's been all over the press today. Um, the culture within medicine and dentistry, I would argue, is not that supportive of people with mental illness. You know, that's not across the board, but that's a sort of very general observation. Um, and I think that in medicine and healthcare we worry about reaching out for support because of the impact it might have on your career development and your career progression and the concerns around you know being reported to the gmc or the nmc and other regulatory bodies um, is huge and it's a really stressful experience to go to it go through if you do end up being reported to the gmc um, so I think, you know, that can exacerbate things and really delay people seeking help. Um, the other thing I always think about is particularly amongst GPs and psychiatrists is, well, who do I go to? Because I know all the GPs and psychiatrists here and I don't want to tell them that I'm struggling with my mood or I'm having suicidal thoughts or I'm feeling burnt out or whatever it is. And so actually feeling able to access support can be really hard. And I think that's when it's important to know of alternative options outside the healthcare system. Yeah, and I think, Jen, I think also, I think it's important to add to that, that uh, as individuals, we can be adverts, if you like. I, I, I run a course, wellbeing course, and on that course, I tell the story of my Annus Horribilis in 2010. And there is no doubt that on the back of that, even quite senior consultants will suddenly think, well, hang on a sec, I probably do need to start looking for some kind of support because that bloke looks like he kind of knows what he's doing and he kind of comes across as somebody who's fairly confident and fairly resilient. And yet he's just described, uh, you know, a car crash. I think, you know, you guys have 
certainly got some quite powerful stories which can reframe the way that your colleagues think about mental health. I mean, I agree with you, there is still a, a stigma attached, but it's nothing like it was 20 years ago. It is getting better. I mean, I've been around long enough to, to certainly think when I was a trainer, you would just mm. not have mentioned it. You know, if I had mentioned meditation as a registrar, they'd have, well, I think they all think I'm slightly bonkers anyway, but they would have definitely be bringing you guys up to get me admitted. And now it's much more, you know, people realize it's a skill and it's a very valuable skill. But like any skill, if it's going to be any use to you, you've got to practice it. I, I do think there's a real issue around who you, who you go and see. Um, I always encourage my colleagues who I can see are struggling to see their GP because in general, I think general practitioners are, are pretty good. Um, Oki Health is a problem, certainly in a lot of environments. They just do not have the spare bandwidth to, to look after the volume of work and the volume of work will be created by this pandemic is going to far outstrip what we had before. Yeah, I think, you know, the stigma is reducing, you know, these conversations are a sign of that. Um, but I, I don't know of many people who would sit in the mess and say, I saw my GP today because I'm struggling with my mood. I, I still think that there's a lot of work to be done around having those conversations. Sometimes it's just so overwhelming that even to just take that first step and to acknowledge that and to kind of like admit uh, to just things can be so overwhelming and it's actually so difficult. And actually, I think that from what I've learned for myself is that actually it was only when sort of crisis hit that I actually sort of said to myself, I actually do need to look at these things. And, and, but it's so hard that actually it's just not something that's pleasurable. But ideally you shouldn't get to that stage, Oliver. I mean, I think what you need is a culture of a different culture, which is, and things are changing. I've seen changes in my own hospital mm. for the better. They're not as fast as I would like, but then they never are. You know, it's like any, sort of, it's not really a new initiative, but initiative that has been around for a long time that is beginning to gain a bit of traction. And ideally, you know, we certainly in anesthetics, we make a very, very positive, because as, as Jen pointed out, we're not great on the suicide. Well, actually, we're really quite good on the suicide <laughs> list, which is not a thing to be top of the league of. But we work very hard with our trainees to make sure that we have got a sort of handle on how bad things are for them. And, you know, they've been, they've been amazing this, this year absolutely amazing considering how tough a year they've had because it the majority of care of the very challenging patients has fallen to them not not to the consultant i think there's been real steps made particularly this year there has been a real shift in the focus of the emotional well-being of the workforce you know you saw wobble rooms and safe spaces and all sorts of initiatives set up very quickly in response to the pandemic um but it is keeping that momentum up now and really continuing that push thank you so much and for sharing that jen um Wafa, do you feel like the cogwheels are, are slowly turning yeah i think there's definitely changes and progression through the years um but it's still as much still alive like people are still ashamed to speak about mental health. Um, but I think it's really important to sort of frame mental health in a similar way that we frame physical health or at the same level in that way, it's not, it's not a shame to catch a cold. It's not a shame to break your arm. So it's the same way when you're not feeling well mentally, it, there's also no shame in that and in seeking help for that. So I think it's really um, important to frame it in that way and know that it's the same way as feeling physically unwell and there is no shame in seeking help for that. Exactly. And I would I would really like to echo everything that you know all of you have said. And I think um, the reason I got interested in mental health actually was from my own experience, I sort of just yeah, I think it took going through a tough time, a really tough time at university. And I think when you're, you know, I was in front of my doctor, you know, with days of not sleeping, you get put on you know, it really, really was horrible. And I think for me, it was, I just, you know, went straight, I, in my head, I didn't even sort of stop thinking I need to get help because I knew if I don't get help, it's only going to get worse. But there's, I think some people get this barrier of being like, okay, um, is, you know, is it bad enough for me to go? If you think it's bad enough for you, if you're struggling, then it is important to go and get help. It doesn't matter how big it is in comparison to other people. You know, if we, I think one time I thought, oh, but there's a pandemic going on. Well, 
it's been going on for a year you know i think there's always something worse to think about and to compare to yeah and i think one thing as well is important um obviously i understand not everyone has this but um to make use of your social support so for sometimes you may feel like you're burdening people with the issues but i think it makes such a difference for example like you were saying you do call me and i call you so even that one phone call to a friend or to family does make a massive difference in the long run i think you're absolutely right and i think for me one of the biggest problems that we've had in terms of trying to manage the well-being of our staff is the lack of social support the lack of the ability to have a conversation without a mask in a safe environment with possibly a beer is incredibly valuable in managing some you know bad things happen on my ward even without covid and they have happened before covid and they will happen after covid but one of the things probably and i i, I think you're absolutely right but for, for me that has been the biggest problem that the mm, sessions that are you know that the various public health bodies have done in terms of trying to manage this pandemic i think that has caused us immense problems in the health service and and will for a, for for the long term and i think it is genuinely something and i've i've written to our health minister to say you you need to address this it's not something you can ignore because it's it's hugely important that we are in some way enabled to look after each other yes it's nice to be able to ring but wouldn't it be nice to meet face to face i mean for me that it's it's i've really struggled with that this year really really struggled yeah, I think that face to face contact is key. So where I work, there is probably about a the health boards over about a 40 mile radius and trainees are scattered across all these tiny mental health units and are often the only trainee there. Um, and they're missing out on their weekly teaching sessions, which would bring the trainees together and allow them time you know to offload to have a whinge to talk about the bosses to talk about what they're doing over the weekend and all those things that you rely on for peer support and we have really noticed the impact that that lack of face-to-face -face time has had on our particularly our very junior trainees who have just started working in mental health and they're probably seeing some quite distressing things as well yeah and um i think what you said about sort of where do we go from here you know we, we might not even really understand the impact the psychological impact that this pandemic has had you know across the board but also within our own working practice and, and you know me as a student it, i can completely it, it resonates with me a lot it's been very hard not to meet up with people and go out and i think you only realize how blessed you are when you when you don't have those things isn't it so thank you so much um all of you for your input tonight this has been really really interesting and i think what i'd want to do now is just kind of bring it to a, a bit of a close tonight and thank you so much because i think what i wanted and i think we've achieved is having people like yourselves who are incredible people so openly talk about mental health resilience and the struggle that you can have but also the skills that you can implement and practice and that it is a practice it's you know it's 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 a marathon not a sprint as we always say and that people can you can still live with all these experiences and the power of your experiences but you can also keep going but you, there's actually ways of learning how to do that and i think i just thank you so much um, for your time and i also want to thank the hla for the opportunity to host this discussion and bring this important topic of resilience to light and hopefully this increase in awareness is the very first step very small step but in the right direction <laughs> and um you know and i really hope that you know you stay tuned for more hla episodes on this topic including self-care mindfulness and performance in elite athletes which we'll be exploring a little bit more later on and we'll put some helpful organizations and i'll summarize the resources that we've been talking about in the description box below if you need any more information Thank you so much for listening and also, and also to our panellists. Thank you for your time and take care. Thank you to everyone that made tonight's episode possible. Whenever our scholars are thinking about complex problems facing our health systems, we encourage them to think about how they make significant change in the world of healthcare. We are incredibly lucky to have some incredible scholars in the HLA. They use the HLA as a platform to take their ideas and bring them to fruition. If you are interested in the work of the HLA, why not join us at one of our future HLA events? Why not join one of our programmes? 
why not even become a HLA scholar? Thank you for joining us. My name is Johan Marlon, the director of the HLA, and it's a good night from all of us.